I'm sorry, I gotta be careful, I have hearing aids. And when you take them off, the mask off, the hearing aids come out. <laughs> and I can't lose them. It is with great pleasure that I get to welcome Ian Shaw and his lovely wife, Linda. Now, Ian is no stranger. In fact, his family worshipped at St. Andrews for many, many years. Now, he is very well known in the Presbyterian circles, and he is not known to sit on the sidelines. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask about the Presbyterian Church, he is the one to ask. And he's a great friend of Karen's, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> As you know, our country had a birthday, but that is not all the birth news we have. We actually have a birth in our church family. Abigail McEwen, born June the 29th, 8 pounds, 9 ounces. A sister for big brother James, proud grandparents, and I'm so glad they're here this morning, Ken and Gail McEwen, and of course... And, of course, that also means that there's a great uncle up here. And I know that great Aunt Shirley's here somewhere hiding. Oh, way over there. So it's always good news, isn't it, to have a new birth. Also, we have other birthdays. We think of our Adam, Labeth, and I can hardly wait to all the young people can be back in the church feeling very comfortable. And we have two great ladies who are having birthdays. And they have gone through a rough time in the last little while between surgeries and a severe fall. And that is Jeannie Millen and Len Lenny Lambert. Now I have something really important to let you know about. And this is from the search committee. You are actually hearing from the search committee. You will know that they are working, okay? The search committee has met twice, and we are now moving ahead and asking our church family to help us. We value the input of our church family as we begin to review applications, interview candidates. Here is how you can help. We are asking that you participate in the St. Andrew's Congregation Survey. We are aiming to have this survey to you all via email by Wednesday, July the 7th, and we ask that you return it back to us by Monday, July 19th. If you would prefer a hard copy of this survey, a copy will be available for you to pick up from our church office. We ask that you please again return it by July 19th. We can also forward you a hard copy via your email if you wish to print it out. And the survey is anonymous. Thank you so much for helping our search committee to move forward with the hiring of our new lead pastor. So if you do not have email, don't panic. You can get a survey, okay? So please do, do fill them out. And we want to thank the people on the search committee. Now, as I thought about Canada Day and what a difference this Canada Day is compared to the fact that we have the virus, and many of us are getting our vaccinations. And we want to thank all the medical people that have been working so hard during this time. 
And then I thought of the residential schools. And as I was going through the Bible, this Psalm 67 came out to me. And I'll tell you why. Because it's all about a nation's needing God. Do you not believe our nation needs God? Do you not believe our church needs God? I'll have a talk with you if you disagree with me, okay? May God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, O God. May all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the people justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, O God, and may all the people praise you. Then the land will yield his harvest. If we want people to come in here, we need to praise God and pray. And God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessing upon this service this day. We thank you, Lord, for living in a land where we can come and worship. We thank you for that. And we praise you so much for so many things that you have done for us. And we pray that you will comfort people and strengthen them as they are going through horrendous memories right now. And people that are working with them, strengthen them also. For this we say in Jesus' name, amen. And now I'm going to ask you to please stand as we sing our national anthem. morning right we look outside it's sunny it's glorious and this is uh, you know I like to think 
of our God seated on his throne, looking down on his glorious creation, going, this is good. And our next song is Behold Our God. It's one of our congregation's favorites. And as you're singing it, just put that image in your mind. This is our Lord is watching over us. He's watching over his creation, and he loves us. If you'd like to be seated, you can take that opportunity now as we sing another of our favorites, Hosanna. From Hebrews and Aramaic, it means save, rescue, savior, or a special honor to the one who saves, or please save us now. It occurs six times in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, and John, as well as many different times in the Psalms. It's a way to praise God. So. Let's do it now. Let's sing Hosanna.
stirring as we pray and seek. We're on our knees. We're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Our next song gives us a glimpse of who God is. He is king. He is ageless. He is three in one. He is savior. So let us all raise our voices high and sing, How Great is Our God.
Hello children, welcome back to our journey of the Apostles. In chapter 12 in the book of Acts, we saw how God sent an angel to free Peter from prison. Starting in the 13th chapter, we can follow how Paul became the first missionary among the Gentiles. After the teaching video, we are going to enjoy an action song titled, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. Enjoy. During the first century, most people around the Mediterranean Sea lived in densely packed cities, all ruled by the Roman Empire. Each city was a diverse blend of cultures, ethnicities, and religions. And because of this, there were all sorts of temples for offering sacrifices to all sorts of gods, and each person had their own portfolio of gods that they gave their allegiance to. But in every city, you'd also find a minority group who wouldn't worship any gods but their own the Israelites, also known as the Jews. They claimed that their God was the one true creator and king of the world. Now all these cities were connected by a network of roads built by the Roman Empire, and so it was easy to move around, to do business, and even spread new ideas. Now one person familiar with these roads was the Apostle Paul. He spent the second half of his life traveling from city to city, announcing that Israel's God had appointed a new king over the nations. This king wasn't like anyone who'd come before. Right. Most kings rule with aggression or power, but this new king rules with self-sacrifice and love. His name is Jesus, and Paul is his herald, who's inviting all people to live under this king's rule. The stories of Paul's travels and how people received this message, that's what the third part of Acts is all about. For some time, Paul's home base had been in the city of Antioch. And from there, he and his co-workers went out on three road trips, traveling by land and by sea to strategic cities throughout the empire. In each city, Paul's custom was to go first to the Jewish synagogue where his people gathered. He'd start teaching and showing how the Messianic king promised in the Hebrew scriptures is Jesus of Nazareth. And some believed this news, others didn't, and still others thought this message was so misleading and dangerous, they would incite riots to kick Paul out of town. And so that's when Paul would take to the bustling city marketplace. He would set up shop there to make and sell leather tents to cover his travel expenses. And here, Paul kept sharing the news about the risen King Jesus with anybody who would listen. He was often misunderstood as just promoting a new God. One time he prayed for a sick person, they were healed, and everyone around thought he must be a Greek God that came down to visit them. But Paul insisted there's only one true God and he was his servant. This message often stirred up opposition and more riots, and he got beaten, even thrown in jail. Why such a strong reaction? Well, the worship of the gods held together Roman culture. They believed the gods kept their city safe, and the temple worship of the gods was a huge part of their economy. Paul wasn't just adding Jesus as a new god to the list, he was saying all other gods are powerless, even a sham. So he's undermining their way of life. Yes, and more than that. When Paul announced Jesus as a new king, he would call him Lord or Son of God, the very titles people used to refer to the emperor of Rome. So Paul's message could easily be heard as a threat against the entire political order. Why would anyone join this movement? I mean, it sounds dangerous. Well, people were captivated by the story of Jesus and how his love created communities where all people were treated as equals, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or economic status. These people formed new families that would eat together. They lived sacrificially and took care of their poor. They lived like Jesus actually was the king. Right. And so in every city where Paul announced the message about Jesus, people were being transformed by God. God's spirit to become new kinds of humans. So Paul would stay in that city and teach them the way of Jesus. And then he would leave for a new city. This was a difficult life. Paul had to endure a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. Yeah, and he did so because he believed that his own hardships were a reenactment of Jesus' suffering and death for others. He said it was God's own love that drove him to share the story of Jesus, no matter the cost. After his third road trip, Paul's reputation had grown. He had made many new friends, but had also made many new enemies that he would be wise to avoid. But Paul didn't avoid them. His next stop was Jerusalem, a city full of people who wanted him arrested, even dead. And so why he goes to Jerusalem and what happens when he gets there, that's what the final section of Acts is all about. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing. 
thing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. In the beginning, God made everything. God simply spoke and the world came to be. He sent a flood and made everything new. He parted the sea and let his people walk through. Now that's a beat to introduce the offering to, so I'm hoping that as you were contemplating what you're giving, that you had that kind of bouncy joy in your heart. In fact, once we really open up, I'm thinking that uh, we should just maybe occasionally do that African practice that you know where they actually joyfully march their offering up to the front. Can't you just see yourselves? I mean, you'll want to go around three or four times to do that, but... We have about three or four ways of you to give, by the way. There will be plates at the back. We won't be taking up an offering. Uh, you can make transfers. You can write checks. You can drop by the office. There's all kinds of ways to give, uh, there's, but there's only one spirit to give in with joy and thankfulness. So uh, uh, commend the offering to you. Um, maybe just before I go into prayer, and we will pray for the offering in that prayer, uh, when Carolyn was talking... Um, she, she mentioned that uh, I was no stranger. Uh, now, if you don't know me, that's probably true. I am a stranger to you, but if you do know me, you'll think the word strange actually does apply to him. So, you know, you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place with that introduction, aren't you? Because uh, uh, I'm fortunate I've been gone more or less for a long time, so most of you probably don't know me. But uh, hopefully when you leave, uh, maybe that strange application uh, won't apply from either direction. But anyway, let's gather our hearts together in prayer. Uh, and then we'll, uh, once the prayer is finished, we will start to attend to God's word. So let's uh, pray together and uh, join me. God, you are the sovereign Lord of the universe. All the rulers of the nation are as nothing before you. We humble our hearts 
and submit our wills to you and to you alone. Give us your love of justice and righteousness. Help our governments to rule in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. May our land yield prosperity for all. Help us to defend those who live on the margins of society, to rescue the children of the needy, to pursue reconciliation among all peoples, to advocate for the powerless, to seek healing for the hurting and justice for the oppressed. God, we are so aware of the need for these prayers that too often in our history, governments and people in power have not acted according to the prayer that we have just made. Indeed, oppression rather than helpfulness has often been their byword. And for those who were in positions of authority and power, they often looked at others as if they were almost not there. It is truly with sorrow we have been reminded that that is too often the history of of human authority as we hear those heart-rending stories of young children, young Aboriginal children, treated as if they were nothing and buried without even a word to their families. And God, that is just so symbolic of how heartless we have been too often in the past. Forgive us for that, God, and help us to be your people, so caring and so compassionate for those who truly are on the fringes and have no other voice to speak for them. May we love and respect you, God, as long as the sun shines. And the moon remains in the sky. May our country be refreshing like spring rain on dry soil. May those who love you flourish. And may our country experience abundance and prosperity until time is no more. May we be united from sea to shining sea and may our influence go out from here to the ends of the earth. Empower us to rescue the poor who cry to us and help the oppressed who have no one to defend them. Show us how to rescue the weak and the needy, redeeming them from oppression and violence because their lives are so precious to you. Gracious God, this is our vision and our plea. Protect us from lesser goals, from desires that are satisfied with the good instead of longing for the best. Sovereign Lord, save us from confusing that which is temporal from that which is eternal. Enable us neither to grow weary in well-doing nor to substitute the worship of the created for the Creator. Today, God, we would ask that you would comfort those who mourn, strengthen those who are afflicted with weakness in body or soul, guide the ones who are confused, set before us pathways of hope, and draw into us uh, uh, into a saving relationship with you, those who are longing for wholeness. God, we lift up by name Rob and Sarah who have serious health issues before them. And in silence, all of us have particular people that we pray for in our hearts. We do that as a community of faith right now.
God, we lift up the search committee. Moving forward. Shifting into a, a different stage now. Wanting input. It's a daunting task, God, to attend to your spirit, to attend to the voices of the congregation, to sift through profiles and tapes and to discern who it is that you have put your hand on for this place in this time. Help us, God, to listen and respond with obedience as you speak. Give the search committee a special unity of heart as they move forward, we pray. Ever present one, we pray that you would watch over all who are traveling, that they might arrive at their destination safely. Refresh the weary. Renew those worn out in their spirits. Holy Spirit, direct, we pray, uh, all the ministries that continue in these different times. And God, we also ask your blessing on the gifts that we are presenting today in one form or another. Accept them, we pray, as a sign that we believe that all that we are and all that we have are from you and are for you. Amen. Just before I read the scriptures, let's pray once more. God, now we ask that you would open our hearts, our minds, our ears, so that we might hear what it is that you have for us from your word today. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the uh, book of the prophet Jeremiah, and we're going to read the first seven verses of chapter 29, and I believe they're going to be on the screen there. Good. And I think the versions will match. If not, pay attention to the screen. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jer Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile. From Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to a servant and then he sent uh, to the king of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon and he said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to the, all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And then from the New Testament, one of those places that uh, our children's story told us that Paul visited, the city of Philippi. It's the book of Philippians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, 
Forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers and sisters, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our our last reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. And since you're going to be sitting for a while, and it is an old tradition in the church, I'm going to have you stand for the gospel reading. So please stand. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. The first few days of July, in what we now describe as more normal times, was probably the busiest weekend on Ontario highways in the entire year. Not only was school traditionally over and hot weather present, but in one of history's accidental quirks, the two largest nations in North America with the longest undefended border in the world, celebrate their nationhood in the span of the first four days of the month. Both countries trace the genesis of their existence back to Great Britain, though one came into being by a sudden severing of all ties with the British monarchy, and the other emerged by a process that gradually loosened those connections. Last Thursday and today are respectively major flag-waving days for the citizens of Canada and the United States of America. There we are. Good. Oh, well, can't help it. (laughs) Enjoy the show if you don't enjoy the sermon. And most of us will happily join with our neighbors celebrating both Canada Day and Independence Day and give thanks for the common experiences of democracy and freedom that permeate our sense of national identity. As wonderful as these shared heritages are and as enjoyable as the festivities and celebrations associated with these special days are as well, this weekend offers an invitation to the person of faith to pause and consider how life as a citizen, say, of Canada, 
influences or is influenced by her life as a follower of Jesus. I propose that this past year of crisis and dramatic changes to life as we have known it makes this reflection even more crucial. Well, technically, most of us trace our faith roots back to Abraham and Sarah, or maybe even Adam and Eve. We really come from traditions dating back 500 years to the Reformation. And Calvin and Luther tended to maintain a state church model with little real difference between faith and citizenship. However, many of the Anabaptists or radical Reformation groups advocated another view. And they often suffered for their beliefs. They took Paul's statement in Philippians very seriously and very literally. But our citizenship is in heaven. Sometimes this belief had some extreme ex expressions, and they refused to engage in any public activity like paying taxes, oaths of allegiance, voting, or military service. Other responses were less radical, but all of them diminished the significance of one's country of residence or national pride. Earth was not their home. They were just passing through. Presbyterians have, from time to time, given this matter serious consideration. In 1954, we set forth a declaration of faith concerning faith and nation, church and nation, but most often, we more, more or less meander along the lines of Calvin and Luther, not drawing much distinction between our country and our faith. The pandemic brought the matter back onto the front burner. We observed two major strands of response to various government actions that impacted many of our usual habits and practices with respect to worship and other ministries. By and large, most complied, citing civic duty and our commitment to love our neighbors, though some in that group did note inequities that relegated the life of faith to near the back of the non-essential activities bus. But grossing aside, they still close their buildings. Others, however, protested more energetically and actively. In defiance of various official orders, they met in their sanctuaries, organized protest marches, and held drive-in worship services. Most mainstream faith communities were less than impressed, and some were quite publicly critical of this expression of civil disobedience. How did you respond? Which approach fits best with your core beliefs around faithfulness and citizenship? Or do either of these opposite responses have anything to do with faithful living? I'm not intending to explore whether compliance or protest, as noted, was the preferred response, but I am intending to use this past year and this weekend of national significance to ponder the dynamic of faithful living and loyal citizenship, and hopefully establish some grounds from which good decisions can be made when tensions between the two appear to arise. Take a look again at the pivotal affirmation in Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven. The context for this statement is critical. Only verses prior, Paul describes the life of faith as that of a person who is singularly focused 
on moving into greater and greater levels of maturity in Christ. All else, past achievements, present status, pride of ethnicity, personal abilities, are pushed aside in pursuit of this one goal. Why? Because heaven is his home. The place, that place of God's full, undiminished presence alone claims his allegiance. As I have struggled with the pandemic and all the changes of the past year and a half, this core faith perspective of Paul's has been brought into prominence. When I experienced chafing in my heart, when I found myself nodding in agreement, when anxiety or, or, or fear or, or frustration or, or perplexity dominated my horizon, it was almost always because I had lost this core outlook. The things of earth were not strangely dim, but glowing brightly and blocking my perception of heaven as my one true home. What about you? As much of what we cling to and appreciate as Canadians became unavailable, did you find yourself reaffirming your essential identity as a citizen of heaven? Or were you greatly preoccupied with losses and limitations? Don't misunderstand me. Much of what has been minimized or lost are wonderful gifts and joys to be experienced with thanksgiving and delight. Even as we are starting to open up more and more, I'm still looking forward to handshakes and hugs and dainties after worship. But right now, here and on your screens, what you and I are doing, we're still being citizens of heaven, exalting the one who reigns in glory. Is that truth? shaping the dynamic of our hearts. The pandemic has forced me to wrestle with this essential perspective and reclaim it as the vantage point from which I engage life. Jesus expands on this in that familiar exchange about paying taxes. The perverse part of my nature that has yet to be transformed takes pleasure in the skill with which Jesus parries the thrust of the Pharisees. It's a bit like observing Wiley Coyote constantly failing against the roadrunner. Jesus' conclusion is extremely helpful. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Helpful but also needing some careful unpacking. The radical reformers read this and affirmed that everything was God's, and therefore nothing was Caesar's, and refused to recognize earthly governmental authority. The more Calvinist reader placed those verses alongside many other passages and affirmed that Jesus was both stressing the lordship of God over every facet of one's life and confirming the role of government to manage earthly affairs in support of God's lordship. Combine Philippians and Mark, and you arrive at an understanding well presented in that 1954 document I mentioned earlier. The core guiding principle is our unfettered, unqualified devotion to the Lordship of Jesus 
and our essential identity as citizens of heaven. All else is provisional, temporary, secondary. That being grasped, we are called to live our daily lives faithfully connecting with the community in which God has placed us. Perhaps one of the best biblical models for this way of life arises from the experience of the exiles in Babylon. There are many ways in which their lives and ours share common ground. Their core beliefs were not shared by the king and his advisors. Babylon was not the land they called home. Yet, Jeremiah counsels them in faithfulness to settle into Babylon and live as God's people in that place. Even more so, he counsels them to do their best so that Babylon will be a country filled with peace and prosperity. Babylon may not be their eternal home, but they are not to live as drifters, but as dwellers in the land. So, taking these texts together, what principles can we discern to guide how you and I faithfully live as citizens of Canada? Here are a few, I believe, are clear implications. The first is one of those apparent gospel auxiliaries, like judgment and mercy intertwined around the throne of God. The principle is engaged detachment. Engaged describes the focus of our energies and resources. It flows from a heart filled with compassion for the plight of those who are spiritually, emotionally, and physically destitute. It's a commitment to sacrifice. Going the second mile. Interrupting one's journey to care for the victim lying in the ditch. Detachment means constantly reminding ourselves that these tangibles are but means to an end. The end being the glory of God. Or to turn a phrase, detached engagement means we are so heavenly minded, we are very much earthly good. A hallmark of this underlying principle will be a life of incredible generosity. From the earthly or engaged side, this will be evidenced in individual and congregational perspectives that are turned outward, seeking to rectify the brokenness that fills our community and our world. Compassion not calculation or circumspection, will determine our interactions and our spending of time, emotional energy, finances, and personal convenience. From the heavenly or detached side, this generous approach to life will vaccinate us from becoming so rooted in the things of earth that we forget our true citizenship is in heaven. The nature of flesh is to crowd out the spirit. By generously engaging the, with the world, we force ourselves to reaffirm our essential identity and become more dependent on the provision of our Father in heaven. Before I quickly add two more implications, let me ask, 
Is generosity and sacrifice are words that fairly describe the pandemic response of your life and that of your congregation? If the answer is yes, then you are being a faithful citizen of heaven and a great citizen of Canada. The story of the exiles found in Daniel also contributes to our understanding of engaged detachment. He and his friends served diligently and with distinction in the government. But they also challenged the king when official policy denied the lordship of God in their lives. One example seems almost trivial, their diet. The others, core, bowing to an idol or praying to the king. In each, God's people drew the line with bold respect. They knew who they were and whose they were. And from that central belief, they acted. Let me end then by returning once more to those two different pandemic responses, compliance and protest. Being engaged and faithful isn't always straightforward. God alone knows our heart's allegiance. Daniel demonstrated bold respect in his challenge to the unbelieving king. Surely, we should do no less with our sisters and brothers as we together seek to love God and our country and in that order. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, one of those great lines in the Hebrew scriptures in the book of Esther uh, is posed as a question. Perhaps God has put you in this place for a time such as this. And God, we know that that's not even a question. We know that that's the truth. Because you are the Lord of time. You're the sovereign. And you have placed us here, God, for this time. You have conspired in your own wonderful wisdom to bring together the particular gifts and persons that we are so that we can build your kingdom in this time and in this place and in this context. Continue to help us to be those faithful, loyal citizens of heaven who do much good to the community in which they are placed. Amen. Please stand as we do our final hymn. From ocean unto ocean, our land shall own the Lord, and build it to the ocean. Oh, Christ, for thine own glory and for our country.
was able to do exceedingly beyond all that we can ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus today and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, Heather. in his